Hello there, this is the video um, associated with the Taylor reading on attachment patterns and um, we're looking at attachment patterns in uh, youth who are insecurely attached or avoidantly attached to early caregivers and then um, how they relate to their environment. And the shift in this section is really a shift towards community. Um, so how do we create community with youth who, by the nature of their experiences, are going to kind of resist community and push community away? And so you might be asking yourself, um, why, I'm, why I assign this particular reading? And I think it's important, I guess, to think about our youth groups in terms of who are the ones who might be the least served by our particular kinds of youth experiences, and then what, um, in what ways are our are youth ministries geared towards maybe the, the more fully or highly functioning kids? And in what ways are, might we be missing out on some of the kids who've had some early experiences of wounding or attachment trauma? And so, again, um, this is an approach that looks at human nature in some of its flaws and complexity and then uh, wants to draw a picture of adolescent identity out of those uh, ruminations. So maybe you might think, too, of Dykstra's picture of adolescence as a troubled time where young people are struggling to get their needs for affection and their needs for belonging met in the same place. So how can I be soothed and fed at the same time? Those are some of the key questions um, that are raised by this attachment research. So I wouldn't say that most of your kids would have severe attachment disorders, but what would it mean to look at, at, at youth ministry through the lens of those severe attachment difficulties? And uh, in what ways um, could we continue to keep youth in mind who become anxious or hostile as a result of us reaching out to them? Um, so you might be asking yourself a couple of key questions as we get started with this material. One question is, are you or could you be an attachment figure for your youth? And you might answer the question uh, by saying, no, I can't really, I can't, I can't counsel my youth per se. I'm really more interested in helping them establish a, a faith, faith life or discipleship. Another question that might follow from that would be, <clears throat> in what ways is your youth ministry like an attachment figure? So in what way can you plan your youth ministry so that it could meet the needs of some of these kids who may not have strong attachment relationships but could be uh, could benefit from an entire youth ministry that reached out to them and um, met their needs and responded to their needs of self, for self-soothing? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Taylor's research. Um, oh, and then I might ask another question. Do certain youth group environments cater to certain personality types, certain temperaments. So is a certain, uh, does youth ministry in general as a model for ministry cater to a certain kind of personality? If that's the case, um, then we might want to try to um, reach out to a broader range of kids, especially, you might argue, especially kids who've had attachment difficulties like these. Because uh, one, one way to think about this is how is there ability to think about God loving them related to their ability to think about themselves as loving as lovable people um, having a kind of internal working model of themselves as a person who's worth love or uh, worthy of love um, and so you might also use some of this research and then try to guess uh, about the attachment patterns of some of your youth leaders and you might uh, find yourself using attachment theory to think about and guess your youth leader's attachment styles. And that also might let you know um, what kind of youth they're most likely to be helpful with. Uh, that might give you a sense of who they, they are going to be the best able to reach out to. And this matters because once you understand a little bit about someone's attachment style, you're more likely to understand some things about their relationship with God as well. Okay, so um, let's go through the first part of Taylor's book. Some of this is review from Siegel. He did it in a, a very engaging, journalistic kind of style. This book is a little more academic, but let's hang in there together and talk a little bit about attachment theory, the first part of the book. 
um, patterns of attachment. And um, if this is interesting, we can talk about some of the, the broader range in the field as we get into discussion on Saturday um, of this retreat. So attachment theory uh, really indicates that attachments have a lot of, uh, they kind of last for a long time across the life, style, life cycle. Uh, this started with research where uh, young children were separated from their families during World War II period in Great Britain. And uh, the, uh, the psychologist uh, John Bowlby started to study what happened to families where that bond of mother-child was broken. Um, in, the, uh, in the research, they discovered that we, we have two drives. One is for proximity, and the other one is for exploration. And uh, I think you can see that in adolescence as well. Uh, this goes back to Lisa Demore's notion of kids swimming on the swimming pool and then eventually wanting to reach out to the side, to the parents who are supposed to still be there. So um, attachment uh, figures can be seen in either genders. It doesn't have to be a mother or a father. Um, and... Uh, Attachment theory does a lot with how people manage the anxiety of change in, in an environment. So <clears throat> what really seems to matter for an attachment perspective is someone else acknowledging your state of mind and then speaking to that. Um, when, it, when, the, when the feelings are normalized, uh, regular feelings of adolescence, uh, or childhood, when those are normalized, a kid can kind of start to calm themselves. Uh, and there's a group of research, uh, this goes beyond what we're doing in this book, but there's a kind of whole field of research about attachment relationships and God. One line of study says that uh, people basically seek in God the same kind of figure they have in a, in a childhood attachment. Another line of research says, no, God actually comes in and revises your early attachment relationships. So um, the first model would be a model of a, a correlation. God correlates with a, with your childhood attachment. Another, the other model is a model of compensation. So God can actively compensate for your early childhood relationships. Uh, well, either, and some of this research has been done by Lee Kirkpatrick, so that might be a name that you want to take a look at as well. Either way, you can see um, there's a, a strong relationship between our attachment needs and then who we see God to be. So if we have uh, relationships where there's <clears throat> serious disruptions in our childhood attachment, um, the research says we might be more likely to have a religious conversion, but that that religious conversion might be followed by more life tumult and we might have multiple religious conversions. Um, and so childhood uh, attachment style isn't necessarily correlated with religiosity, but it does, there is some interesting research out there about attachment and religiosity. I've been thinking a lot about that, the, the idea of a God-shaped hole, and I think the God-shaped hole that we see when we experience our faith, um, the hole that each of us seeks to fill by in relationship to God, looks a lot like our early, early parental figures. So our attachment figures provide a template for what the God-shaped hole might be. Um, so attachment really talks about how the parent and caregiver's uh, emotions are kind of contagious for children. Uh, and so they come across when a child is held, they can tell whether their parents are truly there. Um, and it's actually the quality of the interaction between a parent, between a caregiver and a child that matters, not the quantity. So even a small amount of attachment care can really make a big difference in the well-being, safety, and uh, the ability to flourish for a child. Uh, so the qualities uh, for leading to good attachment are fun, playful, sensitive responsiveness to feelings, um, elaborating, developing, negotiating, uh, reliable provision of comfort, shared emotions, understanding, safety, and satisfaction of physical needs. And again, attachment talks about a pattern and isn't really one moment in time. So you could have a variety of different kinds of um, interactions, but they could add up to generally a picture of uh, secure or insecure attachment. So they call the zero to two month period pre-attachment 
two to seven months attachment in the making, seven months to two years child's development and recall memory. Um, I would say that seven month to two year period is really crucial in the, they call it the birth of the child self. Um, so it's that, it's that during that period that the ability to recall memory is laid down and then to spontaneously retrieve an image of one's parent in one's mind or one's caregiver. And during that time, uh, so yeah, about a year and a half is really when the, the human self is born in relationship to its uh, community or environment. And then um, two to five years is those are those years of goal corrected partnerships. Uh, so the basic uh, takeaway here is whether a child can receive love depends on whether a parent can. Um, security and bonding needs are crucial to independence and maturity. So what looks like immaturity in adolescence or in early adulthood is often a rela reflection of a lack of uh, security and uh, bonding needs not being met. So in this period, the early childhood brief separation is bad, but prolonged separation can be devastating. Um, and so there's a feedback attachment system that needs to be reliable in order for a child and predictable in order for a child to kind of uh, take in a personality that can soothe themselves. Um, on the other hand, if there's kind of too much intrusion or parents are, are come in kind of intermittently and smother a child, a child can also need, might also express a kind of separation distress in that. Um, and I want to just say briefly, there's a lot of ways to express attachment and different cultures have different styles of expressing that. And uh, in some, uh, so it seems like an ideal here would be people saying I love you and holding their uh, children close to them. There's a lot of different ways to say I love you and a lot of different cultural expressions of that. And there's a lot of ways in which uh, community gets involved as caregivers meeting these needs when a, when a primary caregiver can't. So um, in this research, uh, Taylor talks about whether or not you see yourself as worthy of love. And this is a fundamental, what he calls internal working model. IWM is what he'll use for the rest of the book. So. Sorry about that. You all, you know where I'm doing this now. Um, but your internal uh, working model would be um, kind of what you have in mind when you think about the the, uh, the ways other people feel about you. So the way you feel about yourself inside and how that's related to the way that you've seen others responding to you across your life. So if you find fundamentally when people say that God loves you, you fundamentally inside kind of cringe inside and say, well, I don't think that's really true. Um, attachment theory might have some explanations of that in terms of how well you heard other people uh, express that love and worthiness to you as a child. Um, so it gets into the attachment styles here. Um, and I don't think, because we had that so clearly with Siegel, I don't think we need, need to do that in, in great detail. Um, so personality, temperament, how a child's uh, makeup is, is the other side of attachment theory. So attachment theory is about what the caregiver does. And then temperament and personality is about what the child brings, how easily they're soothed, the, the emotion, their emotional responses. Um, and so a temperament, the temperament plays a role as well in, child's, in a child's development. So they call it, when, when generally there's a good match between the internal world of a child and their environment. When a, a child who, who needs a quiet environment is basically in a quiet space, they call that a good fit. So um, a fit is when the environment matches the needs and temperament of a child. Um, so attachment quality shows up not all the time, but especially in times of stress, in times of major disruption. Um, and uh, even without attachment, parents can provide other good things. But attachment is a really also an important part of, uh, of growing up. 
So kids who don't have a good attachment uh, to, to a primary care, caregiver are reluctant to express their feelings to, to you or to others. So they're kids who may uh, kind of do ritualized behavior or become a little bit neurotic, but they're, they're not able to express their uh, dependency needs on anyone else. Um, on the other hand, kids who have a pretty secure attachment are able to express their needs because they have a, a pretty good sense that they're gonna, those needs are going to be fi fulfilled. So there's a sense in which uh, they can be uh, reliably sure of getting their supper so, um, and getting their love and their food in the same place. And because of that, um, they don't have to reach out with all the strategies of uh, bullying and control and manipulation and trying to get their needs met in uh, more unhealthy ways. So some kids, because of disorganized attachment, because of parents who are mentally ill or uh, exhibited domestic violence or addiction, they really aren't able to attach to their primary caregivers as a source of safety. And then, uh, or they might experience a primary caregiver who's very intrusive and unpredictable and uh, doesn't allow them to kind of develop uh, their own rich internal worlds. Um, so some kids in response to that, they don't have a secure attachment and so they overlay a bunch of controlling behaviors on top of it to try to get their needs met. They might be over bright caregiving children who are kind of over functioning in every space they're in in order to care for the adults in their life. And this, so that can be another shape of the attachment disorder. Um, so um, people who, uh, children who are able to attach well are also able to kind of soothe themselves. And so you, you might sense uh, whether a kid in a, a situation that's stressful is able to kind of calm themselves down. Uh, and you might consider uh, how the attachment of a child maps onto the attachment in their, in their parents' lives because you probably know quite a bit about their families as well. Um, again, some questions to sum up this part of the book. Does a does youth group do youth group environments then cater to certain styles of attachment? And once you understand a teen's attachment style, what will you know about how they relate to God? Um, and some people talk about adolescent development as a time of kind of reworking early childhood. So in the years from 13 to 18, as kids grow up and leave, they're actually reworking year zero to three, which is a pretty powerful statement of why attachment might matter again. And so kids who are reliably attached um, seem to have more freedom to leave home as teenagers than kids who have struggled with attachment um, early on. So um, let's turn now to the second part of the book, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the big ideas and the takeaways from, from, this, uh, from this reading. Uh, the, planned, the planned environment. Um, So I was thinking a little bit about uh, one somebody I knew who was in social services, and uh, they were they had to t they had to take a child out of their home, and they uh, placed this child in foster home, and this child uh, wanted to know information about the 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 mother, and uh, the uh, social service agency decided it would not be he wasn't stable enough to get that information, and so uh, instead of accepting their statement, this child uh, uh, stole the keys and broke into a locked filing cabinet to find out more about his file. And in the process, he found out that his mother had a history of drug addiction, and that was part of why she wasn't able to take care of him. But um, this, this child kind of wouldn't let go of the question about attachment until he got more clarity. And uh, even if that meant kind of breaking into uh, a locked file, because something significant about his attachment was at stake in that, um, and, and some of the information about that attachment was withheld from him by the social service agency, but he needed to know, so he broke into the locked cabinet to find out this information. Um, so you might be thinking a little bit about Putnam and the research on uh, parenting in different class communities. I know a lot of you have said that your youth group are primarily uh, middle to upper class um, and that uh, some of the research from Putnam and some of the research on attachment theory uh, seems um, 
Well, Putnam's research on adult, uh, adverse children childhood experiences might lead you to think that in poverty you might experience more um, adverse childhood experiences, but I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Um, some of you are interested in impacts of, of brain development on psychological factors, so you might think about how poor attachment might impact brain development. There's some good research that uh, poor attachment uh, may impact the ability to plan ahead and executive functioning. Um, so humans are evidence-seeking creatures. They're always seeking to know whether there's a world out there that's going to confirm them and love them. And always, they're always working to know if those relationships in the in the world around them are good enough. So, um, especially kids who haven't had a good attachment history, and have had maybe some early trauma, they might constantly scan the environment for threats, which then further damages relationships as well. So, um, the takeaway for Taylor, <clears throat> and see if there's some application in your youth ministry too is that uh, some kids really need a consistent, predictable, nurturing, and stimulating environment. Um, and so one of my questions was, uh, and that those might be kids who are anxious or hostile because of adverse childhood experiences. So if you find that there's certain kids who are kind of always testing your limits and uh, who are perceived by others as a threat, um, it might have to do with some of their attachment uh, patterns or, or, or relationships. And so um, the, the, the solution for Taylor is to give a lot of structure and a lot of support uh, to create a prevailing sense of positive regard. So in Taylor's world, um, a lot of these kids in the British uh, foster care system are being institutionalized and um, who are foster children, and they need a planned environment that's going to keep them in mind and provide experiences of safety and security where they can kind of succeed. Um, so Taylor talks about how children are experts of their own experiences. And the question is kind of how do you help emotionally challenge kids to interpret their experiences? He, he gives a, what I think is a very, uh, very pastoral and kind approach to these young people. He says that, uh, they're in a living hell and doing the best they can. And so you want to offer functional control. You want to offer calmness and quiet. And uh, mentalizing emotionally, which is a big word in this section too, mentalizing really just means keeping somebody in mind. Uh, so there needs to be an appropriate uh, holding environment for caregivers. Low arousal, low stress environment with constant and predictable care. So you might think about how much that applies to youth in your ministry who might be seen as troubled or who might be having trouble attaching to the adults around them. How much do they need warmth, containment, boundaries, a sense of keeping them in mind? Um, here's a quote from page 48. Adolescents can explore the world around them, knowing that they will be welcomed physically and emotionally, and emotionally nourished and comforted and reassured. So um, what, what Taylor is saying here is that uh, adolescents try to get their needs met, their, their needs for attachment met in all different kinds of ways. Um, and as they do so, they need activities and events that have clear beginnings and endings. Um, they need to ex agree to an explicit and regular uh, structure um, to their events in their days. And so um, that in that way kind of forecasting to kids your, what you're going to do and what your environment is, is also really helpful. You can do things like let kids rearrange the, the furniture, um, mention places to run and uh, hide and sit quietly. Um, so in some ways, it's not that different from working with kids who have uh, some kind of developmental disorder like autism. Someone who's on the autism spectrum might have some of these name, same needs. Taylor says that kids who haven't had a good attachment relationship um, need an env environment that's stable to create pr trust and prove yourself trustworthy. They need integration, so someone else they can talk to about their powerful feelings. They need uh, adapting, uh, where they can practice social skills. And then they need a uh, transition, where they can leave those uh, valued and needed relationships. I know some of you are thinking about leaving your own youth ministries uh, 
as because your programs are coming to an end during this time of crisis and transition. And then finally, um, there's a need for supervision among youth pastors to continue to get skills and wisdom as you think about um, these kids who who might have difficulty with you, with your youth group environment. So. Um, So you need to kind of prepare students for the transitions that are ahead of them and talk to them a lot about these transitions as a way of keeping them in mind and telling them why you're doing things. And uh, so children in this environment, when you emotionally broadcast and you share your own feelings and thoughts, even as you organize a space and time, um, they're actually going to be able to not just, to, I won't say attach to you, as much as attached to the youth group environment itself, where they can create some spaces for calmness, quiet, self-soothing, and emotional control. So um, if whatever you can do to let troubled kids know that you're keeping them in mind is going to be powerful for them. Um, and as much as you can create a low arousal, low stress environment in youth ministry with a kind of constant and predictable care, uh, the more that uh, kids will feel welcomed by that care. So sometimes, here's where we go wrong in ministry, we experience uh, kids' symptoms or uh, belligerence as a sign of hostility, when in fact a child might be expressing frustration about attachment needs and making attempts to get attachment needs met. Um, and so what? in what way is youth group a place for attachment needs to be met? And what are some ways to provide a welcoming and safe place for children who have attachment difficulties? Um, what are some ways that uh, young people test the environment and the safety of your youth group as an attachment space? And how is this interpreted by its leaders? Um, what are some ways that you keep kids in mind uh, when they may not be kept in mind by others? What are some ways that you share what you're thinking with kids telegraphing your thoughts and feelings so that they can follow you and your leadership. So some of the big questions from attachment theory are uh, include things like can you ever change your attachment relationships? And it seems like there's some strong evidence that you might be able to. Um, and attachment relationships can change pretty quickly during a time of stress when everything in your world is upended. And you might think of some of the losses and transitions that you've talked about in some of your papers, like divorce um, as a possible time of attachment change. It also, um, one thing all this research does for me is it underlines how important the, uh, we might try to be working with youth in ministry from 13 to 19, but uh, how important a holistic youth ministry is that li that inhabits, uh, kind of lives in the whole life of the church. Because unless those zero to five needs are met, it can be hard to, to reach out to kids later when they're actually um, leaving home and doing a lot of those developmental changes that needed to be laid down between zero and five. So you're thinking about the attachment figures in your own life and how crucial they were to you and what they did in order to keep you in mind and show you that your opinion mattered and you mattered. Um, those people literally gave you a self at a key and crucial moment in your life. And I want you to be thinking about how you can intentionally do that for young people in your care. Not you yourself, because I think that's too much pres pressure as a youth pastor. But how could you create an environment um, where kids who are not your traditional extroverted sportsy types can feel comfortable, where kids can have options about activities and ways of soothing themselves, where they can do attachment play to calm down or some me uh, guided meditation or breathing to center themselves. Um, what might be some ways that you could teach something like mindsight to your kids so that they could learn to hear deeply and listen to both feelings and thoughts as they're uh, sharing in youth group with one another? Um, so one of the goals that we have in ministry is to guide people into the journey of discipleship, which includes a development in the, the fruits of the Spirit. And I think underneath the fruits of the Spirit are really an attachment foundation. So it's, the, it's God's Spirit, uh, which attaches to us, just like that organic indwelling that the Gospel of John talks about, 
that then allows us to create a space to truly listen to someone else, even if and especially if that person is hostile, is belligerent, is doubting our our goodwill or good intentions with them. Uh, and so these are some questions that come up as we think about creating attachment spaces. What if the church was a safe base or a secure base for kids who had attachment needs that weren't being met in the culture, in the community, or in their given home? Okay, my, bless my prayers are with you and my blessings are with you as you're traveling through these many seasons of change in your own lives and your own ministry. And um, I, I hope that you'll let me know if you have any questions. Thanks so much.